Hi, my name is Nimish. And I'm uh, Steven. We're going to talk a little bit about our payments platform at Uber. Cool. So let's quickly go over the agenda that we would like to cover today. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about our mission statement. Steven will share some of the interesting facts around our platform. Uh, we'll discuss our data model and talk about high level architecture for our system. We want to talk about how we launch new lines of businesses and new countries. Uh, and last but not the least, we'll talk about some of the cash dynamics and the challenges we have faced. So cool. What is our mission statements within the payments platform? Uh, we want to make sure that payments is a competitive advantage for Uber and not seen as a cost center. So what does really pay, what, what is it, what entails within payments, right? Uh, so we have collections, which is effectively all the money that comes in. Uh, let's say a customer takes a trip, right? We want to make sure when, once they're dropped off, uh, we are able to collect that money from the customer. So disbursement. So that's pretty much money going out. Uh, every time a trip finishes, our driver partners are the ones that power Uber. So we want to make sure that we pay them reliably and accurately as quickly as possible. And last but not the least, the platform component, right? So we talked about collections and disbursements, but we want to make sure we have a reliable and a scalable platform in place that uh, is able to move this money day in and day out. Cool. So some interesting facts about Uber. First is that we are a very global company. I think Matt touched on it a little bit and we have operations in 65 countries with that number changing uh, monthly. We also operate at incredible scale processing tens of millions of transactions a day. Uh, <clears throat> we also have payments engineering teams all over the globe, including San Francisco, Palo Alto, Amsterdam, and kind of some extended teams in Sofia and India as well. We also have uh, 28 payment service provider integrations, which is PSPs in the slide here, as well as five integrations directly with banks. Cool, so let's uh, get into some of the details of our architecture. Before we can talk about our architecture, uh, I would like to introduce some of the core data models. Uh, so the most important concept that pertains to our architecture is, is we call it a payment order. It's a fairly general concept, uh, the idea here is that this concept is not tied to a specific country. It's not tied to a specific business. And that renders itself very well to be, uh, to kind of build a platform, uh, which means that, you know, as, as we kind of expand on different dimensions, uh, the core part of the platform stays stable and doesn't need to change. So what is really this payment order? A payment order, as we define it, is effectively an encapsulation of all the money movements that needs to happen uh, between all the parties that were participating in a given business transaction. So let me kind of give an example here, right? Again, I'll, I'll keep going back on the example of a trip. A trip happens, there's, there's a rider, there's a driver, and Uber is also considered a party within that transaction. So effectively, this is a transaction happening in the real world that has three parties that need to be captured and money is going to move between these three parties. So what is the core principle when we are moving money between these parties is we call it zero sum principle. Effectively, the sum of all the money movements across these parties, it has to be zero, uh, which means you can't create or destroy money. Uh, interestingly, you know, we, we sometimes get data from our upstream systems that's not quite accurate. And our system will effectively not record this payment order. It will fail and, you know, our on-call engineers would need to kind of go through the troubleshooting and see uh, what failed, if anything. I mean, uh, so this kind of gives us a pretty balanced system where you know at a at a single payment order we are able to do checks and balances and make sure things are kind of in good shape so now so we we talked about the payment order the second concept i wanted to talk about is uh, we call it the account uh, and a, typically a user or a merchant a driver they will have one or more accounts as part of their systems uh, and every account obviously will have a balance uh, and as you kind of have different payment orders that these different users participate in, the balance of for that user is going to change once these transactions are processed. So let's kind of introduce a couple other dimensions on top of these concepts, right? So let's say if we go to a new country where we're going to actually look at the payment instrument that's more prevalent there, right? So pay, let's say India uh, and Paytm is uh, kind of one of the top wallets there. There's UPI as well. So as you expand and build these instruments out, the top layer, which we call the platform, is not going to change at all. 
Cool. So kind of taking a lot of those concepts and actually mapping them into the architecture that we have. So first we'll get this uh, business event. This could be uh, trip completion, eats completion, anything like that. That is then mapped into this generic order by what I'll call here the payments uh, platform API. This uh, order is then ingested by our money processing systems. This is what actually updates our account store to keep track of the balances that are kind of accrued uh, from the order, as well as uh, reaching out to all the different PSPs that might be might need to be involved for any collections or disbursements. And uh, all of these orders are also stored for auditability in an order store that we have. <clears throat> these orders are then additionally ingested by a lot of our downstreams. So this is things like receipts and invoices, financial reporting, and partner statements. Cool. So thanks, Stephen, for the architecture preview. We want to actually now go into the details of you know, some of the design principles behind building this system. So one of the top ones that uh, we focus a lot early on was, you know, we want to make sure that the money movements that we capture are consistent. And what do I mean here, right? So I talked a little bit about the concept of payment order. Uh, the idea here is that a payment order by definition is immutable. Once it's written down, it cannot be changed. Uh, and again, going back to the trip example, what if a customer writes back and says that, you know, a driver actually took a very inefficient route. So yes, we, we would probably need to change the fare on it, the way that works is we're going to actually create a new money order, which is called like an adjustment order that is linked back to the original order. But again, going back to the core definition, once a money order is written down, it cannot be changed. And this aspect of it makes our system fairly compliant as well as auditable by definition. Uh, the, the second concept I want to talk about is the concept of a hold. Uh, and let's talk about drivers now, right? So if a drive, so driver is taking number of trips, they are accumulating balance in our system. They have $50 now and they want to cash out, right? So we want to make sure when they cash out, uh, so there is on-demand payments available, but we have different other triggers in our system, which are based on cron jobs and schedule triggers, right? And so we want to make sure that we don't want to disburse or pay this money out more than once. The way this works is you have $50 in your account before a money order is actually being written down. Uh, we place a hold on this balance for the upcoming order. Uh, and that way only one process uh, can actually ever claim that balance. What if there is a crash after someone placed a hold? The holds auto expires after a certain number of days, which is kind of large enough time uh, to deal with any outages or downtimes that you might experience in your system. So second important concept I want to talk about is optimistic logs. Uh, this should be pretty standard. Uh, the idea here is the, the core entities or the objects in our system are version. And that means anytime, and again, the great example here is if you want to update a balance for a user, uh, you need to read the user entity first. Uh, you read it, let's say at version one, and when you send the write back to the storage system, you're going to actually send a conditional write, which only applies if the version is still one. And so effectively this allows our system to be self-containing and doesn't require uh, a need to have distributed logs or build another system where we can actually keep track of distributed logs. The third important thing is, uh, you know, we, we have various money orders being written and communicated across the system. We want to make sure that the processing system processes it exactly once, not zero times, not multiple times. Uh, and you know, this kind of enables and make sure that we never end up double charging or double paying our, our users. Last but not the least, uh, most of this architecture is built using message queues. Uh, and the idea here is, you know, it allows us to build components that are loosely coupled. Uh, and it also allows us to scale them as we see fit. Cool. So kind of circling back to the business aspect of this. Uh, so launching a new line of business. Uh, in 2014, Uber Eats launched. And at the time, eaters were charged automatically, but restaurants were actually still paid using spreadsheets. and uh, kind of an ops process. In 2016, we completed the restaurant payments automation, and this allowed Uber Eats to expand to over 100 cities in just that year. So in 2017, Uber Freight launched, and this actually was also the same year that our new payments platform launched. And with the new payments platform, we've really been aiming at optimizing for launching new lines of business so that new lines of business do not take a large amount of time to implement on our system. 
Uh, so kind of looking at the history here, we want to go down from, you know, the two years that it kind of took Uber Eats to just a couple of weeks for a lot of the new lines of business like bikes, scooters, and things like that. So let's also look at from a perspective of what happens when we want to launch a country and how that has evolved over time. And we'll be focusing more on the payout or the disbursement aspect for this. So all the way back in 2014, we, we had the concept of country specific forms. Uh, driver had access to a portal where they can go and change or add their banking information. Uh, our payment systems would use this uh, to generate CSV files. And these were then emailed out to our accounts payable team who then need to actually manually upload these to different bank portals, depending on which country we are in and which banking partner we have. So came 2015 is when, you know, we said, okay, we need to invest into something better is, you know, when we started looking at some of the direct bank integrations, uh, we kind of looked and implemented ISO 222 protocol. And, you know, this massively reduced the time or the engineering time it took to launch a new country uh, from various unknowns and manual processes to down to a couple of months. Come 2017, uh, we made some advances and you, we recognized that our systems have stabilized enough and, you know, we, we add a new country every once in a while. So why don't we kind of try to reduce the engineering time further? So we use this concept of config slash templates. So every new con every country, in fact, that we use to pay out using ISO 222 protocol gets its own template. And, and that kind of takes the need to code out of actually launching a new country. You're just actually doing or adding new configuration for that country which is effectively a template with some overrides that are specific to that country's banking system. This brings down the engineering time to a couple of weeks. And, you know, 2018 and beyond, we want to actually get to a world where these config driven uh, configs and templates are driven through a portal where product or our business folks can actually come in, make certain updates based on the new requirements or actually add a completely new template for a new country that's launching and, you know, ideal world, but, maybe no engineering required at all, so. Cool, so talking about cash a bit, I think um, <clears throat> Matt kind of touched on what a big business opportunity it was for us, but thinking back a couple years or uh, a little longer into 2014, a lot of the experience of Uber was actually the magicness of being able to get out of a car without having to fumble with your wallet and you know, get out the correct change to pay the driver the real driving factor for this was actually the prevalence of cash in a lot of developing markets like India and LATAM. So when you think about cash, it's actually a very different kind of money movement model for Uber. Uh, with digital payments, the rider uh, is collected from by Uber, and then Uber kind of takes its commission and can pay out the driver. For cash, the rider is actually directly paying the driver and Uber doesn't really have the opportunity to take its commission from the rider. So in this case, uh, we actually need to collect from the driver, which leads to drivers being in arrears. So in a lot of these really cash heavy markets, we ended up with millions of dollars owed to us from the drivers and we, needed a, we need to still kind of find ways to effectively collect that money. Uh, there's also challenges around actually the amounts that are collected. So when you're collecting with a digital payment method, you can specify exactly how much you need to collect and exactly how much you need to pay out. But for cash, the rider is paying the driver and you don't actually have that much control over how much money is being handed over. The rider might not have change for the exact amount that the trip costs. Uh, they might not even have enough money for, to cover the amount of the trip. And so we need to make sure that our platform is flexible enough so that these kind of over and under payments are accounted for and the rider ends up paying for how much the trip costs and the driver additionally gets paid for the work that they've done. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks. taking the time.